So this is our back to school social work event. We know as social workers, we are hailing from all different parts of the country in this meeting, which is very beautiful. Um, but every district runs its school social work very differently. Every state does, every city does. So please keep that on in mind as we are sharing our insights from all over. That's the little disclaimer that we all have different capacities and roles. So always check in with your district. Important. Great hacks built into there as well. And speaking of school wide, Sandra, go ahead, Sandra. Hi, everybody. I'm Sandra Gonzalez, and this is actually my 11th year of school social work. Definitely building positive school culture is my passion. I really love it. Um, one of the main reasons that I like uh, doing school wide events and doing things school wide as, as tier one is because I like everybody to have the same language. That is a really big part of uh, my job. So we implement PBIS and MTSS, a PBIS positive behavior intervention support and multi-tiered systems of support at MTSS. Those are the buzzwords you'll learn. Education has lots of acronyms. Um, so my favorite thing to do is to make sure that every single staff member is trained in PBIS because that is the push in our district. When I mean everyone, I mean everyone. It doesn't just mean the teachers, it means the, and the students. It means the office staff, the librarian, the custodian, the cafeteria workers, the lunch duty supervisors. I make sure I train everyone so that everyone has the same language of what the expectations are for the students. Um, another way that I like to have everyone do the same language, and this is extra, but because I've been here for so long, I actually run a school news show, which means that I have a group or like a club where students and I make this little 10 minute video that is for every week and we do announcements and we actually do an SEL lesson every single week. So I have a script that I write out for them and they do the introduction of the lesson and then teachers go off and then do the rest of the explaining of the SEL lesson for that week. My other favorite thing to do is planning like school wide events. I just think prevention is just so important. Um, so I look at the awareness days. Um, so like ASCA has an awareness calendar that I kind of peruse and see and pick and choose kind of like what's important to my community because I do think it's important to keep in mind your community. My uh, link tree on my bio, you will see an awareness calendar, the Ask Awareness Calendar, as well as kind of an at a glance calendar of the, the days that I use in my school. So you can always take a look at that. Um, so we look at heritage months, what days are important for us to celebrate. And then I throw in some fun days in there as well. And then I plan school-wide events around it. So like, for example, on anti-bullying month, I don't celebrate the whole month, like one day a week, the whole month. I actually do an anti-bullying week. And during that week, students are doing all kinds of activities. We're doing recess and lunch activities. We're doing classroom lessons every single day. And then we're also doing like spirit days, for example. How do I do that? Staff buy-in. So the reason that I can get staff buy-in is because I make it very, very easy to use. If I plan anything, if I plan a lesson that requires something to be printed, I print it and I give it to the teachers. So it does put a lot of work on me in the bigger picture, but at the end, it also elicits staff buy-in because if let's say it requires a worksheet, then I'm printing worksheets for the entire school, giving them to their box, giving them a reminder and saying, here's the lesson for today. And so then it ensures that they are going to be easily able to access that and use it. I also make sure that it's fun and engaging for the students so that the staff actually wants to do it. Friendly competition goes a long way. So we do a lot of spirit days where we compete of like, which grade level is going to have the most kids that dressed up. I work in Title I school, so a low income neighborhood. So I always make sure that my spirit days are accessible. And I think that's another important part of when you're building school-wide activities. So for example, one of my fun days is Star Wars Day or Mario Day, March 10th, M-A-R. One zero spells Mario. So for Mario Day, they could wear something Mario or Nintendo based, or they could wear red for Team Mario or green for Team Luigi. Everybody has something either red or green in their closet. They can go pull it. Um, I also do like beginning of the year spirit days could be like grade level competition. So kindergarten is green, fifth grade is blue, first grade is red, and then everybody can just pull something from their closet. 
Star Wars Day, you could wear something Star Wars or black and yellow because those are the colors of the Star Wars logo. So you want to make sure that everything that you're doing is accessible because that will ensure that more people are participating. I also make it very like friendly competition where the teachers, let's say, are worth more points. So like, let's say each student is worth a point. I make the teachers worth five points because that will ensure that the kids will remind the teachers to dress up because they want to win. So that's also, you just make it fun, engaging and easy, and then they will do that. And I know that it seems really daunting to say like these school-wide activities, but my number one advice for you would be to start small by just hanging out with the kids at lunch and recess. That is my number one thing that I do at the beginning of the year. I just hang out with them and then I do fun activities. So that might include like just taking a boom box out there and put, if boom box still exists, but like a Bluetooth speaker and um, putting music on and dancing with the kids. Or I've organized a like basketball hoop shoot where we do a competition of like who can shoot the most basketball out of 10 baskets or something easy like that that's really fun and that will get you like Amanda said that will get you out there the kids will know who you are and what you're doing and it's the fun engaging activity where you're not always just doing crisis but you're doing prevention so the kids know who you are so my top three tips for takeaways are going to be make it user friendly for students and staff make it engaging so that it's fun and then make it easy to access for staff and student buy-in. I love those. Oh my gosh. And everyone's going crazy in the chat because we are very intimidated starting off or even kind of, if that's not our personality, it's like, how do I do this? Thank you so much for sharing those tips. We're going to move into, and we talked about school-wide, right? Intervention just now, but more about school culture and dealing with trauma because we know that it's been a, a rough few years. Hello, everyone. I am so excited to be here. I'm Joyce. I am currently a social worker serving grades pre-K through eighth grade in Chicago Public Schools. This is my fifth year. The, according to the National Child Traumatic Stress Initiative, over two-thirds of students will experience a traumatic event by the time they turn 16. And that's really based off um, adverse childhood experiences as the definition of trauma. And I would really push us to look further and beyond that, because trauma is really anything that overwhelms the coping systems that we have available to us. And it's, it's not just these instances that we see in the ACE survey. It's also intergenerational trauma, trauma from systemic depression, um, trauma related to COVID-19, bullying. Um, we have to acknowledge too that some of the trauma does occur in our school buildings. And so we want to minimize that as much as possible because what trauma does is it leaves our students stuck in survival mode. And so that means they're not accessing their executive skills as easily from their prefrontal cortex. They're not developing those skills as much. They might have difficulty forming um, trusting relationships. They might have physical symptoms and misdiagnoses um, ADHD is a really common misdiagnosis for trauma. So it's a place where we can really impact students' experience by building schools that support all students, including students with trauma. And the number one thing I would ask you to do is help create a felt sense of safety throughout your school. And you can do that one big way is through predictability. So make sure you ensure that both school-wide and in classrooms that there's um, routines and structures that students can depend on, that they know exactly what's going to happen and how it's going to happen when they come to school every day. And if there's something that's going to change, so that they're given a heads up as much as possible so that they can prepare mentally for that. Another huge one is positive relationships. And we know um, the statistic gets thrown out a lot that just one positive relationship with an adult can have such a huge impact on a child's trajectory. And it's true. And I would encourage you all to really build capacity because that relationship doesn't just have to be with you as the clinician. Um, also, like Sandra was saying, like, um, I would, I leverage, um, my lunchroom manager is amazing. Uh, I have custodians who are amazing. So many people who want to be involved in this work um, that are not clinicians, and they can help you out by building those sort of mentorship type relationships with students. Um, and then also structural supports are really important. So like Edith talked about having a referral system. It should be easy for kids to get the support they need for mental health or case management, restorative discipline uh, systems, boundaries, so clear expectations that are tied to safety and consistently enforced in terms of rules um, in the school building, interventions, group interventions, like check in, check out, um, and really just making sure that there's an uh, environment throughout the school where students can really get their needs met, whether that's flexible seating or a system for being able to take breaks as needed. That's really important. 
And I would encourage you all to really start with the adults because, right, you can't do all of this overnight, but you can lay the groundwork by working first with the adults in your building. Provide them psychoeducation on how trauma affects students and how common it is. Um, teach them composure skills because the thing about trauma is often it leads to challenging behaviors and often adults can escalate that because they don't have the skills themselves to remain composed and really give the students what they need in that moment. Um, I would encourage even a tap out system where uh, teachers can acknowledge within themselves like, whoa, I've reached my limit in this moment. I don't know how to deal with this situation and I need to take a moment to um, recompose myself so that I can be um, the best presence, adult presence in this room as I can. And so a system where they can call for another adult to come step in, supervise the kids for a minute so that they can get themselves together and come back ready to deal with the situation at hand. Um, and also make sure that you're teaching concrete skills to teachers, whether that is structures, like maybe a talking circle or something like that, that's trauma informed that they can implement in their classroom. And also things like sentence stems um, that you can give them that they can use. Like, for example, you can put your phone in your pocket or you can put it in your backpack, but you can't have it out when we're trying to learn. Giving them different verbiage that they can use and adapt for themselves is really helpful too. Um, anyway, I've done this from the ground up at a school that didn't have any of this in place yet, um, and I love talking about it, and I'm always happy to help. My DMs are open. I love talking to you all, so feel free um, to hit me up so we can chat more about trauma-informed supports for students. So beautiful, Joyce. Thank you so, so much. I love the choices. You're very eloquent in sharing all of that. Omar says you're dropping gems. Of course, that's why I'm so happy this is recording, because I'm like, oh my God, I can't keep up. And we are going to move straight into, as you mentioned, consistency is key when building relationships with students that are a little bit harder to reach. You know, sometimes, you know, that can be very tough. So I'm going to bring in Bianca now and kind of going back to building relationships with those harder to reach students. So I have a lot of experience working with kids that are difficult to reach, right, that have been failed by our school systems a lot of the time, unfortunately. Um, and my job was really to try to just be that one positive person maybe in their life or at least within the school system. And I always go by two big things and they sound simple, um, but it can be hard because these kids will, what I say, will try you, right? Um, they will push the limits and see what you can do. The first big one is being authentic. I talk in their language. Um, I let them know how I'm really feeling and allow them to also share how they're really feeling, right? I think kids know when you're not being yourself or when you generally don't care um, and they will call you out on it, right? Um, they will say like, you, you don't care about me. You're just kind of going through the motions. So it's important for you to be always authentic to yourself um, so that they are able to connect with you, right? I always say, my first line is like, I'm a stranger. I don't expect you to tell me everything. I wouldn't tell a stranger my whole life story, um, but I'm hoping that through this, we'll get to know each other and that I can help you, right? Um, the second one is unconditional positive regard. Um, so that means that every time I see a student, it's always a welcome, warm interaction. Um, and sometimes it's difficult. That can be really hard because a student may have cursed at you the day before, may have walked out of session, um, may have eloped from the building, from the classroom. Um, and the next time I see them, I'm always say, like, hey, how are you? How are you doing? Um, and that can be hard, right? Because we have feelings, we get our feelings hurt. And if a kid talk to us, talks to us disrespectfully, it can be kind of hard to not take it personal, right? Um, but that's the thing, unconditional positive regard. No matter what, I will always be here for you. My office will always be a safe space for you. Um, yeah, you kind of cross the line and we do address that, right? Like that was not an appropriate way to talk to me or that was not an appropriate action to take. But hey, you know what? Let's try again, right? I'm still this positive person in your life um, because a lot of times that's what they do. They want to test limits. Many times before other adult relationships um, have gone and come and they haven't been consistent. And that's our role, right? To be consistent and say like, hey, I'm still going to show up for you. And I also try to tell teachers that because I think sometimes staff members may personalize that behavior. Like, well, that kid hates me. That kid doesn't like me. It's like, that kid's really not even thinking about you in that way. That kid is just not able to control their own emotions. So guess what? Give them another chance tomorrow. And that gives that kid hope, 
right? Because if there's no hope, there's no point in changing. Thank you so much, Bianca. That is so beautifully put. And it is so crucial to be consistent. I know that is really hitting some people in the chat because it's going to get tough. And it's harder when we have the staff or maybe even a supervisor that is not aware of what we're doing or our own methods. And so I'm going to segue now into um, Jasmine.